Hello and welcome to the Deep Sea Podcast, a punk take on a science podcast about everything deep sea. I'm Dr. Thomas Lindley. The professor has left me to go and have adventures on the high seas, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But in the meantime is our science communicator, Georgia Wells. Hello. Hey, Tom. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for helping out. Glorious leader is shining his light upon others. We'll just have to make do in the meantime. Uh, so Alan is out just off Japan. It's a really interesting area. Three Hadal trenches basically come together. There's lots of interesting biology. Why are things in one trench and not others? The things he's shared so far are very, very exciting. So we're looking forward to being able to talk about those. And he's also tweeting quite a lot more. Uh, so from the field, nice pictures of snailfish and of the sub and all the gear. So we will send a link to his Twitter channel as well. So you can see what's going on while he's out there. So in the meantime, me and you are going to hold the fort and talk about some deep sea science. Big boots to fill. Big boots to fill. <laughs> uh, to get us going, what is the soundtrack to your brain? What what has this last month felt like? I recently moved city. So I've moved away from the beach and into a city and all the leaves are like falling on the ground and it's very autumnal. So I've been listening to uh, California Dreaming by the Mamas and the Poppers. So so that's my soundtrack recently. Summer's over. Nice. That is for your old autumnal vibes, you've got a pumpkin spice latte in your hand. Exactly. A few scented candles. Yeah. It's, all, it's all good. <laughs> and it's not the UK's unprecedented heat wave. Absolutely not. And that everything is dying. Yeah, nothing to do with uh, No. <laughs> it's, it's fine. It's just autumn's a little early this year. What's a drought? Who knows? No, no. It's all, it's all fine. <laughs> um, I, I want to talk about, about where you're recording. You are recording in a wardrobe. Of course. Well, right I've just moved, so everything is echoey, and the only place I can find that <laughs> is not sounding like a cave is uh, inside my wardrobe. So thanks, Alan, for the tip. It's good to know that your legacy is living on whilst you're not here. <laughs> well, it gives you that authentic Alan exactly, sound. Exactly, exactly. So we decided to to take a quick selfie before we started the record, so you can visualise us. Exactly. And we can jump in with some news. So lots going on, actually. We, we were struggling to decide what we would talk about. Super busy month, yeah. It has been. Do you want to jump with the first one? There's been some new tech developed, actually. Calcified deep sea infauna that was previously quite hard to uh, capture can actually now be imaged with a 3D acoustic coring system. Some researchers in Japan have uh, developed this coring system that's allowing them to visualise the animals with the calcified exoskeletons, so like bivalves, living below the surface of the sea floor. I think it's the first time that they um, managed to do this in situ actually in the ocean they've been doing a, a few lab studies where they've been able to make it work but they actually went down to um, the deep sea to do this so they did it off Hatsushima hydrocarbon seep which is in Saganami Bay in Japan uh, it was about 850 meters to 1200 meters deep and um, yeah they were able to uh, detect some clams that were living in the seabed uh, so they're completely invisible otherwise to the naked eye and to uh, other imaging software but yeah they've managed to figure out how to see them uh, under the muds, which is really exciting because um, now they can uh, have a look at how this interacts with the whole ecosystem. Cool stuff. Very cool. So crunchy things hidden below the surface that we wouldn't usually see them. And that means we wouldn't usually account for. Exactly. That is very cool. One that I found was, it turns out that sponges sneeze. Researchers in the University of Amsterdam have recorded two species of sponge expelling mucus as a sneeze. So sponges are filter feeders. They pull water in through their, their spongy pores filter out anything that's delicious and then sort of expel it often through a, a big sort of internal chamber, basically. So a big exhalant funnel, essentially. And those pores can become clogged with things that they can't actually eat. And so these researchers using uh, stop motion filming, basically, to, so to speed up the sponges, seeing how they, they contract their whole bodies, basically, to expel this material that they can't digest as like a, a giant sneeze. It takes about half an hour. Sponges aren't exactly highly mobile animals. So uh, a half an hour sneeze and a sneeze is so satisfying <laughs> that I can't. Can you imagine just having it go on for half an hour? I, I just, really oh, can't, the release. Not, honestly. Uh, and so they believe this might be common to all sponges. We just haven't noticed it before. And so that includes our deep sea sponges as well. So interesting little extra mechanism that despite being one of the most simple animals on earth we've had a few surprises from the sponges they do some interesting stuff after you just assume that they sit on a rock and don't do anything the underdogs of the sea some might call them well speaking of little little dogs of the sea the lovely giant isopod the bathynomus these are like the the pill bugs the wood lice the slaters they've got lots of common names the giant deep sea variety of these uh, there's around 20 species within that genus, uh, including some really big ones that sort of approach almost, I read almost half a metre, almost 50 centimetres, wow. but I, I feel like 
they're usually around the 30, 35 centimeter mark, but it sounds like there's some records. And we've got a new one. We've got a new species. It was captured in 2017 in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, just off the coast of the Yucatan at about 600 to 800 meters deep. So they're, they're pretty common in the Gulf of Mexico, actually. You just have to put some bait down and they turn up. And that's how this one was captured using a baited trap. And it was actually kept in an aquarium, Enoshima Aquarium in Japan uh, since that time. So it's actually alive. It's been in an aquarium. And I guess just the aquarists were looking at it day after day. And it's just like, that that one's not like the others. That, one, that one's got some subtle differences. And uh, yeah, backed up by genetics, turns out it is a new species. So we've got another giant deep sea isopod to add to your list. Speaking of new species, there's been a whole team of international researchers, actually, uh, many of them from the Natural History Museum in London. uh, And they've recently done a big uh, expedition to collect lots of animals from the Clarion Clipton zone. They've collected 55 different organisms from the benthos of this zone using ROVs. They've brought them all back up and they've realised that only nine are actually referable to known species. So there's up to potentially 39 species that are completely new to science. They were all collected between 3,000 to 5,000 metres deep related to um, the mining and, you know, the mining efforts that are going on potentially down there. They're trying to quickly describe as many species as possible. I think they were only looking at uh, images and video data before this. So it's actually some of the first time that they've seen these species uh, in the flesh. So yeah, very cool stuff. One of them is actually called the uh, the gummy squirrel, which is one of my favourites. Great. It's a sea cucumber, but it looks delicious. Mm-hmm. It looks like it looks like Haribo makers. It's like a sea cucumber <laughs> with a, a banana on the back of it. It's very cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's got a sail at the yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool and delicious looking animals. <laughs> There's been a, a really interesting like equipment rescue. I don't think avalanche is the right word. A sediment flow, uh, but the largest one recorded on Earth so far. So scientists were studying deep sea currents in the Congo Canyon, and they lost several of their sensors when a colossal deep sea avalanche sort of ripped through the canyon and detached these sensors from their moorings. And the sensors were contained in orange floats, uh, about the size of a football, which floated to the surface of the Atlantic Ocean. And that's when the like film plot starts, because something happened. These floats were the only witnesses, <laughs> and uh, they've gone missing. So rescue boats managed to track them down months later, recover the data, and the data on the sensors revealed that a huge turbidity current, travelling more than a 1,000 kilometres from the Congo River estuary into the deep sea, Uh, making it the longest avalanche of sediment ever measured on Earth. And it took two days for the flow to reach an ocean depth of more than 4,500 metres. So just a huge amount of material rolling down into the deep sea bed. This is a process that we see lots of evidence of. You know, we come back to an area and the, the benthos has changed. You know, of course, we've got the continental slope and we've got fine material being discharged from rivers. And every now and then, that all slumps off and it all cascades and rolls down to the deep sea. And we see this in the trenches as well. We see this when there's there's a big sediment slide along the sides of the trenches and it can smother a lot of animals. It can lead to a lot of die-off and be sort of negative, but it is also bringing lots of biologically enriched uh, sediment into the deep sea. So it's also a massive food source. It's a, it's a bit of a mixed blessing to the creatures of the deep sea. And there are creatures that have adapted to uh, to overcome or at least rapidly take advantage of things like this. And there will be others it will be negative for. But uh, it's incredible to sort of capture real data of one of these events. We knew they were happening, but it's we always miss it, basically. We see the evidence after the fact. Alvin's back in the water after his refit. So Alvin has had a 18-month refit when the new bit's taken on. So the submersible's returned to the water and has completed a historic dive to 6,453 metres. So all of these new upgrades that Alvin's had over the last 18 months is what's allowed the submarine to go to a maximum dive rating. And it originally was 4,500 metres deep, and now it's been extended to a new limit of 6,500 metres. This sub had to make this historically deep dive in order to get that qualification to pass these new dive restrictions by the Naval Sea Systems Command, uh, so Navasi, and they require this dive to be made for this certification to be um, to be given. So Alvin's back and he can now go even deeper than ever, which is very exciting. I didn't realise that Alvin gets a refund every five years. So this is just the latest in um, a whole history of Alvin refits, which is very exciting. Uh, Alvin's a bit of a celebrity of a sub. Uh, it's been going for a very long time. I, I think it might be I don't know. Is is it it's still the original from like? I think so. I think it's over back. fifty years, which is 
incredible to think. Over 5,000 dives, apparently, Alvin's done now. This was the big jump in its depth capability. Colleague and someone I've published with a lot, Mackenzie Geringer, was, is out there at the moment. And she, she got a dive, so she got to visit the Hadel Zone, a very exclusive group. So uh, very jealous of that. Very she cool. was uh, she was messaging me from the, on board. Very, very exciting times. We've got a new area of hydrothermal vents have been found off the coast of Mexico. Uh, newly discovered vents standing about 10 to 12 metres high, in an area roughly the size of a football field, so not not huge. Um, but the interesting thing about them is they're high temperature off axis hydrothermal vents on the East Pacific rise. So it's unusual for vents to be here. Actually, they're usually associated with the spreading centres. So that's where the tectonic plates are coming apart, and you actually get new seabed, and so there's geothermal activity going on there. But finding them in this area lets us know that they can also persist off the main axis. And these may provide vent communities that can then colonize the newly formed vents at the axis. We're becoming more and more aware of deep sea vents. We know they have a lot of specialist fauna. The difficult thing is, how are they persisting? Like, how long are these vents active for? Because they do go dormant as the plate moves past that hot spot and it stabilizes. Uh, the thought is that they're quite in terms of geological time, quite short-lived habitats. So how are all these specialist animals finding and colonizing new vent fields? How, how on earth haven't they gone extinct? Because they must be hopping from one vent site to another. So on the last episode, Alan mentioned rather cryptically getting some emails asking him to go hunting a mysterious object that fell into the ocean. A few more details have been sort of published on this. So back in 2014, an object crashed into the ocean just off the coast of Papua New Guinea. So this starts to sound a little bit like a spy novel or sci-fi because the trajectory that it entered Earth's atmosphere would indicate that it's from beyond our solar system. So that would make it incredibly interesting to study. But the data that allowed us to know that came from the US Department of Defense spy satellites, which are designed to monitor earthly military activities. So they are a bit cagey about the actual specifics of the data and how they were able to measure it and how accurate their measurements are. So that all sounded a bit mysterious. But recently, Space Force confirmed in a tweet, I still, I'm not used to saying Space Force and it not being... Um, it being a real thing, basically. Uh, but they confirmed that the data is accurate enough to confirm that this object came from outside our solar system. And they've identified a 10 kilometer square search area to look for this. It's probably about half a meter wide when it crashed, but it probably fragmented. So this is a very difficult thing to be looking for, uh, even in a a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer grid. I mean, if you sent an actual vehicle down there, you're probably only seeing a couple of meters at a time within your spotlights. So the upside of that is that it is likely to be magnetic. And there's uh, a team planning to uh, to hunt it basically using a towed magnet. Really interesting to see if something comes with that. It, it's strange that one of Alan's stories about some of the strange things that he gets requested of him. Uh, we now know a little bit more and it sounds interesting. So on our last few episodes, we kept coming back to cavey critters and the interesting parallels between evolution within the dark deep sea and evolution within cave systems. I feel that the differences between these communities unveil interesting things about evolution. We heard from a listener who uh, had some comments on this and it got us thinking. Hi, my name is Martin and I just finished listening to episode 25 talking about bioluminescence. And the question was brought up, is there bioluminescence in submerged cave systems? I've been cave diving for the past 17 years as well as have a strong educational background in developmental genetics. I have never seen bioluminescence in a submerged cave. It's just too darn energy demanding for these critters. Plus, since they have no eyes, it would be an evolutionary waste of energy as well. Nothing to conserve the adaptation. Plus, in caves visited by divers, fish outside the cave like to fall divers into the caves and eat up all the blind critters. Those fish left behind in the dark cave would most certainly eat up any critters with bioluminescence, thereby ending any point mutation that developed in the first few hundred meters of the cave pretty quickly. Like Eddie's analogy of the panther in the Astrodome, I also discussed this topic with an explorer I know who's been exploring caves with heavy biofilm, termed bacterial caves. I call them snot caves because the bacterial mass tend to look like big old snots hanging off the walls and ceilings. She has also never seen anything remotely similar to bioluminescence either. As for blind critters, most of the species in caves are small anthropods or crustaceans. However, fish and blind salamanders are down there as well are pretty cool. I think there was one salamander in Eastern Europe that they put a marker on that did not move for about seven years, whereas another one was quite active and moved a meter or two in a whole year. So they are pretty conservative about their energy expenditures. As for the loss of eyes, the Mexican blind cave tetra 
has recently been shown to have lost their eyes due to epigenetic changes as opposed to DNA mutations, primarily through DNA methylation, resulting in the genes responsible for eye development to be silenced. They start eye development as embryos, but the process is quickly aborted and the residual eye tissue is quickly reabsorbed. A recent study made in Mexican cave tetras from different isolated cave systems and found that 40% of their offspring regained development of functional eyes, showing that each cave species had different genes methylated and thus silent. And for the record, for Old Spice antiperspirants, I prefer Fiji sent over deep sea 10. Thanks. So that was our listener, Martin. How lucky are we that we've got such knowledgeable people listening in? Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Oh, and they choose to listen to this. Mm-hmm, oh, right, dear. of all things. That got us thinking, you know, dad's away. Dad, dad, <laughs> dad's off doing science and we've been left in control. And I've got to learn about caves. I'm sorry. I know I know it's not officially deep sea, but I feel it informs so much of deep sea adaptation that I'm... I want to learn about caves, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> Is that okay? Can, have can our... I learn about caves? <laughs> while we're... For sure. We can have our rebellious teen phase. Whilst dad's away, we can uh, learn about the caves. I think that's there. Yeah, we'll have ice cream for breakfast <laughs> and we'll <laughs> learn about caves. <laughs> Sounds good. Bed at midnight and ice cream in caves. And you've managed to find for us the person to talk to. He literally wrote the book on cave biology. So um, I'm excited to hear what he says. Let's give Tom a call. We are lucky enough to be joined by Thomas Eiliff, a hugely successful cave biologist, contributed immensely to the field throughout his career. Uh, He's recently retired as a professor of marine biology at Texas A&M University, where he was based since 1989. And prior to this, Tom worked for 11 years as a research scientist at the Bermuda Biological Station, uh, which is where he became interested in marine cave biology. And during his time in these caves, Tom discovered an unprecedented variety of crustaceans and other marine animals that are specially adapted to the cave environment. Tom's led expeditions worldwide to study and collect animals from underwater caves in the Atlantic, Mediterranean, and Indo-Pacific. And his work has resulted in the discovery of over 250 new species, 55 new genera, seven new families, and three new orders. Not many people can claim new orders. (laughs) This is some big stuff. So thanks so much for coming on, Tom. My pleasure. I'm happy to be here. I suppose the first thing is you're probably wondering why you're on the Deep Sea Podcast. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. We're crossing the streams a little bit. We've we've had a sort of run of episodes on the deep pelagic and the sort of open water deep sea. We've touched on bioluminescence. We've touched on how their vision works. And we have often said that they're more shaped by being dark sea animals than by being particularly deep sea animals. It is that very specific predator-prey interaction in the near-complete darkness that has shaped these animals. And parallels with cave biology sort of kept coming up. And it's something I've enjoyed dabbling with because I feel there's there's so many similarities that the differences actually teach us a lot. It reveals a lot about what the ecological drivers are, both in the deep sea and in cave systems. So thanks for for coming in as an outside expert who can help us to to contextualize this. Well, I have some things actually that are inside the loop. So my specialty deals with animals living in saltwater caves. So I work with marine animals. And the caves I work with are located along the coastlines of islands, of peninsulas. And the caves are close enough to the ocean that at depth inside these caves, there's normal marine salt water. And the animals that are inhabiting are marine species that have had their origins from the ocean, that have invaded the caves, and have stayed there for long periods of time. A few of these animals that we're studying have close relatives, actually, in the deep sea. And the cave and the deep sea habitat, as you mentioned, are quite similar in many ways. So they're both totally dark and lightless habitats. They're both habitats in which the amount of food is limited because there's no light, hence no photosynthesis going on. And so in some caves, as well as in the deep sea, there's chemosynthesis going on. So chemosynthesis, as opposed to photosynthesis, is the production of organic matter and food with use of chemical energy rather than light energy. So in the caves and in the deep sea, 
we have some very familiar or very similar phenomena going on, and also uh, we have some very similar animals. So it may be that caves are not just limited to shallow water depths, they may extend down the sides of islands and sea mounts and uh, land masses into the deep ocean, and there may be caves and cave animals in the deep sea. I bet there are, actually. That's going to be completely beyond our current study right now. Most things are lowered down, or we wouldn't want to put a submarine into too deep of a cave. Yeah, there's probably whole dedicated deep sea cave communities that maybe we've not even seen yet. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's why we're so fascinated by the work we do. We're always discovering new things, and we've just basically scrape the tip of the iceberg here and there's a lot more to be discovered. How are these caves sort of typically forming? Are they long-lived established habitats and stable for millions of years or are they are they quite ephemeral like the hydrothermal vents? The caves that we deal with are principally either in mostly in limestone rock and occasionally in volcanic rock as lava tube caves. And so when we began diving in these caves. It's essential that scuba is used, first of all. We have to go sometimes very far in and often very deep down to get to the salt water and the animals that we're looking for. Well, when we began diving in these caves, we found that in the limestone caves anyway, there were massive stalactites and stalagmites. And so these are the same mineral formations that are found in limestone caves on land. And if you go to a tourist cave, a show cave, you'll see these very beautiful stalactites and stalagmites occurring. Now, stalactites and stalagmites only form by dripping water. So they have to form in air. They can't form underwater. And so when we found them in these underwater caves, that's clear proof that these caves had to have been dry for very, very long periods of time. And so this was during the ice ages. Sea level was as much as 120, 130 or more meters lower than it is today. So all of the caves basically that we've been diving in, sea level was down far enough that these caves were completely dry, completely air-filled, and this happened for very, very long periods of time, tens or even hundreds of thousands of years. So the caves are forming in the same manner that limestone caves form anywhere else on Earth. So the caves primarily date from periods during the ice ages, during periods of lower sea level. It raises the question, where did the cave animals live when the caves were all dry and air filled? <laughs> and that relates back to what I mentioned earlier, that we don't know how deep or how far these caves extend down. So there's still a lot to be unearthed and discovered in the work that we're doing. In terms of knowing roughly when the ice ages were, you've got quite a firm idea of of when this habitat opened up. But like you say, you don't know if animals radiated directly from open water relatives or if there is a comparable environment that they, they colonized from. My preconceived notions, which in science are typically very wrong, I thought that the animals we would likely find would have close relatives in the open ocean in the area around the caves. And so I had a hobby of exploring caves, and I had a hobby of scuba diving. And when I landed in Bermuda with my first job, I went out strictly as a hobby and visited numerous caves who were close to the house I lived in. And these caves were very close to the ocean. Bermuda is a very small island, so nowhere in Bermuda are you very far from the sea. We went to caves on a hillside. You'd walk down into the cave. And very soon you'd come to beautiful, clear, blue saltwater pool that was rising and falling with the tides. So I'd look down underwater and I could see tunnels going off and disappearing into the darkness. 
And that had me intrigued, of course. Mm -hmm. So I got some friends of mine from Florida who were cave diving instructors to come over, and they taught a cave diving course for myself and several of my local friends. So we began diving in the caves. And as I mentioned, as we went deeper, we got into saltwater layers in the caves. And there in the saltwater, we saw all sorts of small animals swimming about. So I collected a few of these animals, and I sent them off to a premier scientist at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, asking if he could take a look at them for me and see if they were anything new or unusual. Well, uh, a week or two later, I got an email back from him, and he said, Tom, I've never seen anything like this in my <laughs> life. Uh, this is the world expert on crustaceans, and he tells me he's never seen anything like it in his life. Well, that's pretty good. That's I a good first that, day. That's a, <laughs> a, good, a good way to start, right? So this was a totally virgin environment. Nobody had explored these habitats before. Nobody had been there because you have to use cave diving. So it's not just regular scuba diving. There's very special procedures for diving in caves. So, for example, when we dive in a cave, we use about one-third of our gas, our air supply, to go into the cave. We reserve one-third to get back out of the cave and one-third for emergency situations, which sometimes do occur. So it can be very hazardous, can be very dangerous environment to go in, and we have to take very special precautions have very special training, and use very special equipment to do all this. And that just didn't exist on, on Bermuda prior to you uh, showing an interest and in, in bringing those skills over? It really didn't exist very few other places in the world. A lot of the work that was done in developing cave diving technology, equipment, and procedures was done in North Florida in freshwater springs. And it was the people who were diving in these springs that I got to come over to Bermuda and teach us to dive. When we did this, every single dive that we did during our training course was going into a completely new and unexplored cave. <laughs> So we had no idea what to expect. And this That's was an intense our training. Introductory <laughs> training course. <laughs> So that's very unusual. I don't think that very few other people can have that lay claim to uh, that type of accomplishment. No, no. I suppose somebody has to explore them first. But uh, Yeah, yeah. But not in your training course anyway. I know. <laughs> oh, that's incredibly exciting. Once you started realizing that there was, there was a unique biology down here, are there common themes across sort of the major orders within caves? Absolutely, there are. We have typically eyes that are very reduced or degenerated or totally absent, with a few minor exceptions. Pigment is usually totally missing, so the animals are completely white and blind. But they do tend to have longer appendages, especially antennae, uh, with mechanoreceptors on them so they can see or sense, actually, uh, movement of water and movement of other organisms in the cave, say uh, prey organisms, if they're a predator, for example. They do have uh, advanced metabolic features that are able to basically slow down the rate of metabolism and therefore use less energy to get by. Uh, so there are a number of ways that these cave animals are specialized. One of the most amazing things, to me anyway, was, as you mentioned, many of the animals were not just new species, they were totally new, higher groups of organisms, previously unknown from anywhere else on the planet. I was doing this work in Bermuda, and I said, well, what the hell is going to be in caves elsewhere? We've got this incredible stuff here in Bermuda. What is in, for example, in the Bahamas, uh, where there's very similar caves that are called blue holes? Or what's in uh, caves in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, where the caves are called cenotes? 
So there's underwater caves in a number of other places that are very similar in many ways to the saltwater caves we had in Bermuda. So I started going out to some of these different locations, and we found very similar types of organisms in the caves in Bermuda, in the caves in Yucatan, in the Bahamas. Also, another place we did a lot of very interesting work early on uh, was Volcanic Cave in the Canary Islands off the western coast of Africa in the Atlantic Ocean. We found similar animals in caves all over the earth, basically, it turned out. Oftentimes, we have a hypothesis that these animals had their origins very early on in the history of the formation of the world's oceans, and particularly the Atlantic Ocean, when the continents, Africa and Europe, North America and South America were all squeezed very close together. And as these continents began to move apart, we had animals that were living in one area being separated into two groups. And so these animals tend to be very ancient forms. Uh, they tend to be living fossils that help to explain not only evolution on the planet, but also the movement of continents and geology. They're really, really primitive forms sort of preserved in this environment. And we, we see similar in the deep sea. We've got the chimera, we've got the frilled sharks. There are groups that used to be abundant in the world's oceans that almost got outcompeted by modern forms. And then just the deep sea representatives uh, sort of persist. So it's amazing that there's, there is living very, very old life uh, in these caves, although they've, they've no doubt continued to evolve and they are they are modern forms, but they have their origins in some very, very old lineages that maybe we've lost everywhere else. Absolutely. That's uh, perfectly true. So there's a lot of uh, tie-ins here between the caves, the saltwater caves that we're studying, and the deep sea in so many different ways. I like it. Could you take us through sort of the main characters? Could we, we almost do a walkthrough of the trophic levels? What is producing the energy down there to, to the, the first grazers up to the, the apex predators? What does it look like as a habitat? We've still got a lot of work to do, but I can fill you in on what we know. We have basically a simpler food web in the caves. There's not as many steps in the food chain. But we do have predators, uh, several predators, including blind uh, cave fish uh, that are at the top of the level. And we have a very unusual organism that is only in these saltwater caves. It's an animal called Remipedia. Now, Remipedia is a crustacean, but it's a very strange crustacean. It looks more like a centipede, but it's not in any way, shape, or form related to the centipedes. It's just totally different from, from anything else that we know of. It's a predator. It has venom-injecting fangs. It's the only crustacean that's known that has venom-injecting fangs. That's really centipede. That's incredible that it's so much convergent evolution from a crustacean. That's from a amazing. Crustacean. Also, these animals are hermaphroditic. That means they have both male and female uh, organs in the same individual. So there's no separate sexes in these organisms. We know very little about the life history and reproduction of these animals, but we did find in one cave larvae of remipedes, and we know which species they belong to because we sequenced the DNA from the larvae and we compared it to an adult that lives in the same cave and we got an exact match. And we were able to follow several different stages in the life history of the larvae as the larvae developed, but only with one species of remipede. Now there's, uh, right now, there's 30 different species of remipede, but for 29 of them, we know absolutely nothing about the uh, larvae and the reproduction and the development. I'm really surprised there's a larval stage at all. Do you think they're dispersing? There's a the hope of finding other cave systems, or do you think it's a remnant from their, their past life, essentially? Well, I think that these animals tend to live far enough into the caves that the larvae 
have less chance of actually being swept out of the cave into the open sea. So the animals are not near the cave entrances at all. They're far in and deep down into the caves. So they're in an isolated environment that basically stays where it is inside the caves. Well, the other thing is that it one species and only in one cave. They do seem to be isolated to their independent cave. And I'm guessing the genetic variation is really quite tight. Once you sequence these, individuals are, are very closely related, I'd assume. It, it is. We're working right now. I have a former graduate student of mine. She just graduated uh, with her PhD, comparing all of the different known species of remipedes and sequencing their DNA. Uh, as I mentioned, there's 30 different species. There's about 14 different genera, and there's something like seven different families of remipedes. And most of the species are found only in a single cave and nowhere else on the planet. Do you think they radiate it from a single ancestor, one common ancestor, and then as they specialize in each cave, they've been isolated time and time again? So th that's anybody's guess. <laughs> uh, but most of these animals are found in the Caribbean area. In the Bahamas, there's 20 different species of remipedes just from the Bahamian archipelago. But if we go across the Atlantic Ocean to the Canary Islands, to this volcanic cave, there's two species of remipedes only in this volcanic cave, and there's no other place on the eastern side of the Atlantic Ocean where we have remipedes except one cave. Wow. And then if you move over to the other side of the planet, there's one single cave in Western Australia uh, that's near the coast of the Indian Ocean, and that's the only cave there that's known to have remipedes. This feels a lot like our Hadal snailfish, our, our sort of apex predator and the only Hadal trench adapted fish, really, the, the obligate Hadal trench living fish. We, we find them incredibly spread apart. The, the genetics is looking like there was a single common ancestor that then something about this family of fish makes them very good at going deeper than all other fish. And then each time they went into a trench and decided it was a fantastic place to live and made their home there, they kind of speciated and got isolated. And these, these groups aren't mixing anymore. Sure. And this is true not only of remipedes, but quite a few other of the cave animals that we have. Many of the species are known only from one cave and nowhere else on the planet. And that raises a lot of concern and a lot of issues relating to conservation because these caves are located close to the coastline. They're in areas where touristic development is placing high value on the land where these caves are located. Oftentimes, the water from the caves is pumped up and utilized in the resorts, or also that the wastewater in the resorts goes down into the caves and pollutes the groundwater and the cave water. In Bermuda, there's numerous caves that have been destroyed by limestone quarrying activities and have literally disappeared. There's other places where building of golf courses has destroyed caves or filled them in. Many caves have been used for solid waste dumps. So what better place to throw your garbage or trash or pollution than a hole in the ground? It's already <laughs> there for you to dump your garbage in. Nature's been. <laughs> sure. We feel that there's been many, many species that have disappeared, literally become extinct because of the actions of humans. There's such old and stable environments. You know, like you say, you could build a golf course, you could add loads of fresh water because you're watering a crop and that might knock them out. You could then fertilize that crop and that could knock out a whole community you're not even seeing because it's where the yeah, water yeah. drains into the ground and you've got no idea you're doing any sure. harm. Pesticides, herbicides, there's been a friend of mine who dives in caves in uh, the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, and he was diving in caves, and the water just got so nasty that he couldn't believe it. He turned around, came out, and he got really sick after coming out of the oh. cave. 
what happens if you're a tiny animal that lives in that environment for your entire life and mm-hmm. somebody dumps all this poisons on top of you? It's going to be the end. Yeah, we're losing things we didn't even know about. Absolutely. It turns out that they're, they're not just a loss of, of species diversity for the planet. These are a logbook of ancient forms that could teach us a lot as well. For sure. So that's why we're kind of in a race to discover, to describe. And one of the reasons why I'm excited to be here is I want to tell people the story of what amazing animals, what an amazing environment we have under our feet. We don't even know about it. And we're in the process of destroying and polluting and killing off organisms that we don't even know and now we'll never know about. You have to protect them every day, but you can only lose them once. Can you keep them in the lab? How do they cope outside of the cave? Not very well. We've been able to keep some of them alive better than others, but the problem is there's a very special environment down in the caves. So there's no light, no photosynthesis, and no photosynthetic oxygen production. So the levels of dissolved oxygen in the water in these caves is exceptionally low. And most animals, if we put it into the cave water, would basically suffocate for lack of oxygen. There's not enough oxygen to keep them alive. The cave animals are very specially adapted to live in this environment. But if we bring the water up, the oxygen levels are going to change. The microorganisms that are living in the water are going to change, die off, and new ones are going to come in. So the whole basic ecosystem in which the animals are surviving and living is going to be modified when we bring it up. So that's the the biggest problem uh, that prevents us from doing this. One of the things we've thought about trying to do, if we can find the right cave and the right environment, is to bring the laboratory into the cave and pump up water from deeper down in the cave, run it through aquaria, and then investigate the animals more thoroughly. Are you just looking for an excuse to live in a cave? Oh, yeah, sure, (laughs) sure. Maybe my eyes will degenerate, my skin will turn white. The little bit of, of sort of cave biology I had an understanding of, I realized is mainly freshwater. And this feels like a very different flavor, like the freshwater ones, they feel a lot more, a more recent and more temporary invasion of a cave system compared to these very, very old marine forms. Absolutely. So in the caves that we're studying, there's actually a stacked layers of water of different composition. So at the very surface of the caves, there's oftentimes fresh water. And as you go down, Deeper and deeper, you come to a layer of brackish water, a mixture of, say, half fresh water and half seawater. And between the layer of fresh water and the layer of brackish water, there's a very sharp boundary called a halocline, similar to a thermocline, temperature separating different water masses. Here we have salt content separating different water masses. And if we go even deeper, we come to oftentimes the second halocline, and that separates the brackish water from the fully marine water. So different animals that can live in different water masses right on top of one another. It feels a bit sort of Alice through the looking glass, like they're they're looking at each other through these hazy boundaries into a whole different world. Actually, when you go in and you first look at the halocline and it's undisturbed, it appears to be as thin as a sheet of paper. So it's a very sharply defined boundary. It's only when we go through the halocline and disturb it that it gets mixed up and everything becomes hazy. But as soon as you get down into the deeper water again, then everything becomes crystal clear. The water in these caves is exceptionally clear. There's essentially no particulate matter in the cave. So when we do see something in the water in front of us, almost certainly it's an animal. So one of the ways we find animals, we pan our light, dive light, very bright dive light back and forth in the water in front of us. And if we see a bright white speck appear, that's an animal. We have a little 
uh, bottle that we fill up with water from the uh, layer where the animal is living, and we very carefully get the animal to swim into our bottle, cap it up, and we know exactly where this animal came from. Oh, what an experience. It's like nothing else. Oh, it's it's really a thrill. It, it's a combination of adventure, excitement, science, and discovery. So it's <laughs> everything coming together. And it's so cool because we're right there. It's not like you're in a submarine and you're watching through a window and a mechanical arm is going out trying to catch something. Or sending a camera down and you're watching or remotely. Or sending a camera down. We're right there. Yeah. We're sticking our arm out and collecting. And we're seeing all this firsthand, being there with the animals firsthand. And it's just such a exciting adventure. Very personal. Uh, these animals have very small populations, so we don't want to over-collect. So we're very mm. careful to only collect what we need to respect the environment and respect limited populations. But you really have to do some collection in order to be able to tell people, hey, this really cool stuff is there. You have to do work to preserve it. So if we never collected, if we never did any science, we wouldn't know it's there and there'd be no reason that we could put on the table to protect and preserve these very fragile, delicate environments. Absolutely. I walk a moral tightrope because I'm, I'm, I'm big on conservation, but sometimes, you know, someone will write in and say, how dare you kill these amazing animals? It hurts. But at the same time, I'm like, yes, yes, you didn't even know that this animal existed. And now you're annoyed that somebody killed one. Good. Like now you're primed. Now you're ready. I I'm willing to be the bad guy if that means that now you care about this animal and you might you might have an opinion if something happens to it in the future. Absolutely. So that's the type of you know work we have to do. We go to the same cave. I would say there's no cave I've ever been in on the planet that I couldn't go back to it today and find new animals that I didn't <laughs> know about. So there's always things to discover. I'm never done with the discovery phase, even in a single cave. Also, in addition to finding the animals, now there's new techniques that come out. We want to sequence the animals. We're doing work looking at the uh, nervous system, the digestive system of these animals, looking at uh, metabolic processes in them. And there's so much to be discovered. It's not just, hey, there's a new animal. That's cool. What is that animal doing that is enabling it to survive in this very difficult, extreme environment. So I mentioned the remipedes, for example, and we sequenced the DNA of the remipedes, and we wanted to compare it to other arthropods, the jointed leg animals, so it includes all the crustaceans, of course, but it also includes the insects and the arachnids. So when we sequence the remipedes, it turned out that the remipedes are a sister group to the insects. Wow. If you want to study insect evolution, you have to be a cave diver and dive in saltwater caves. <laughs> hey, I mean, that's obvious, wasn't it? Why didn't people figure that out before? <laughs> it's, it's clearly where they go, or where these ancient groups are preserved. It's so, so important because it, it's not just the animals themselves. They can teach us so much. They're solving problems that we didn't know biology had solved. You can imagine my difficulty in writing research proposals that we're going to discover things that are totally unknown and <laughs> unpredictable. But that's what we do. Everything we discover is unpredictable. So we couldn't have ever dreamed this up in our wildest science fiction <laughs> novels. That's exactly how our applications end up looking. It's like, we've got no idea what we're going to find, but I guarantee it'll be new. And then they're sort of like, well, we're not going to give you money if you don't know what you're going to find. No, that's exactly why you should give us money. <laughs> <laughs> if I knew the answer, I wouldn't be asking for money to find out. I've been working on this for about, uh, oh, 40 odd years now. And there's still so many places to go and so many things to do, so much to discover. And every time we go out on a trip, we discover new things. For example, uh, a few years ago, we had a trip to the Canary Islands. In this cave, we had been studying for some time. But at the end of the trip, we had enough 
scientific discoveries that we were able to complete a entire issue of a scientific journal. So we had, <laughs> for a two week trip, we filled an entire issue. You did of a journal. special edition. <laughs> So that's not too bad as far as scientific productivity, I think. Not many fields you can do that. <laughs> and so I have a, a little recipe that I have for success. First step is all you have to do is you find a new field that no one has ever worked on in science. <laughs> step one. <laughs> step one. Step two is obviously you're the only person that is doing that. And step three is that makes you the top scientist in the world in your field. <laughs> Open your eyes up and look all the way around you. And there's so many things in this world left to be discovered and described and investigated that there's plenty to keep you busy. I like that a lot. You read sort of about famous scientists and it is very much, you know, everyone else was almost walking past with their heads down and somebody just, just caught sight of something and thought, well, why is it like that? You know, you, you with the caves during your early career, it's just like, well, why isn't anyone looking down there? Absolutely. And there was even books that were written prior to any of our work that said, oh, the saltwater caves uh, don't have anything living in them. Uh, they're not scientifically interesting. Don't bother looking. Don't believe people who tell you that something isn't going to work. There's nothing there. Go check it out for yourself. That's what happened in the cave in the Canary Islands. I contacted a scientist who'd been working in this cave for 20 odd years. But he said, yeah, come over. We're going on a trip there in a couple months, but you're not going to find anything. We've been studying this cave for um, 20 years. We know everything that's in it. Uh, there's going to be nothing left for you to discover. And so we went there and our very first dive in the cave we found a Remipedia in the cave, literally blew his socks off, was the first Remipede ever to be discovered outside of the Caribbean Sea area. It's always worth checking. It's, everything <laughs> is worth checking. Could I ask you a, a question from my own work? Sure. It was something that turned up during my thesis. Basically, within some of the populations of, of deep sea fish, everything morphologically was telling us it was the same species. But within the population, there was a proportion that were totally without pigment, this brilliant white, whereas the natural forms were sort of a muddy brown. It's, it's how I ended up sort of dabbling a little bit in the cave stuff. I read about the blind Mexican cave fish and that they'd, they'd all independently had different mutations of, a, I think it's the Oka 2 gene. Yes. It loses all coloration and it often also means that they're blind or that their vision is damaged, but it has no other negative effects. And I was wondering if that's a common mutation that springs up fairly regularly then in the deep sea, maybe you're not punished for that mutation. It's also not selected for. So it just exists within a population, brilliant white individuals as just a proportion of the population. They're not being wiped out and they're not taking over because it offers no advantage or disadvantage in the deep sea. But they just sort of persist within that population. Sure. Well, there's a couple theories that have been put out as to why animals in caves, for example, the fish could lose their eyes. One theory is that it's constructive evolution, that animals without eyes would need less food. And so if you lose your eyes, you're going to be able to have more energy to use for other organs in your body. Another theory is that it's just random processes in evolution, that a mutation occurs that knocks out the eyes. And if that mutation occurred in a surface form, the fish would die off if it couldn't see to find food or avoid predators. But in the caves, a mutation like that is a neutral mutation. It doesn't have any positive or negative impact on the organism. So those are questions that still need a lot more work. Let me ask you a question. Sure. So approximately how many of the deep sea fish, for example, are eyeless and how many have either large eyes or well-developed eyes? It's a weird mix, actually. That There are some that have lost their eyes, but it's not as many as you might think. And I feel like in the deep sea, 
there was an interesting evolutionary fork in the road when bioluminescence came along. We're totally beyond any sunlight, but the animals are, are producing their own light and there is channels for communication there because of that. In a cave system, you know, there's no point in developing bioluminescence if nothing has eyes. It's almost sort of missed that avenue, whereas in the deep sea, because the animals generated their own light, some it's just not important and they'll lose their eyes. There's a cusk eel I particularly like. Its common name is, is the faceless cusk eel. And it does have rudimentary eyes if you dissect it, but the head is just totally blunt and eyeless. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd say more than not, they possess eyes. Some are large, but it can be misleading because when we look at their brains, we realize that actually not a lot of processing power is being dedicated to the eye. So they're a big collection disc, if that makes sense. They're a big sure. receiver of a weak signal, but they're not. it's not an important signal. And then there are some where the eyes are, they're damaged, they're probably not image forming, but they still do develop the eyes. And I think they are more of a, of a bioluminescent detector. So it doesn't form an image, it doesn't resolve anything, but they can see that it's more sparkly over here than it is over here. So that probably means there's something I can eat. So there's, there's sort of three camps within the deep sea, which is really fascinating. And then on the last episode, we were talking with Justin about how they actually might perceive that environment. If it isn't an immediate visual environment like we're used to, maybe they build up an image over a much longer period of time. So rather than these point flashes of light, they build up almost a heat map of where the bioluminescence is. So maybe they're not even using their eyes in a way that would feel familiar to us as like immediate visual animals. So uh, the only place that I know of where there is bioluminescence in caves is in uh, Australia and New Zealand, uh, where there's glowworms. And the glowworms are little worms that live in the ceiling of the cave. They drop down on uh, webs, something like a spider web, and the glow tracks insects that are flying into the cave, get tangled in the web, and are the meal for the glowworm. But that's in a dry environment. As far as aquatic environments, we've never seen or have any indication that there's any bioluminescence. And because of that, are uh, basically all eyeless. There's a few shrimp that have large eyes. Possibly that's because they may be spending time near the cave entrances, may come out into the open pools in caves at night and go back into the dark areas during the day. The glowworms were the only example I could think of, and I think it's key that they are hunting eyed animals that wander into the caves. Absolutely. It's not a sort of closed loop. They're not hunting cave species. It's amazing that there's so many differences, but also so many uh, similarities between caves and the deep sea. Yeah, and I feel like it's the differences that reveal the mechanisms going on. Uh, that's why I, I really wanted to talk about it. It was a bit off our usual track, but, you know, as you have said always look into these things don't <laughs> you know don't, if it, something's interesting then uh, go and find out so uh, oh, sure, i'm very sure. glad we did and the next thing is to find out how deep these caves can go we're limited by human physiology as far as depth looking for cave animals how deep can a human go is not necessarily how deep a small crustacean can go in the caves. Uh, there's been some papers I've seen that there's evidence for volcanic lava tubes to be present on the seafloor. Another area that's prime for interest for me is the mid-ocean ridges. So many cracks and crevices and things, micro caves for sure. Is there any way that you can also use remote operated vehicles like ROVs to scout out the cave before you go in or is it all completely, completely human based? Could that potentially get you deeper to these new habitats? Yes, it is possible. The greatest problem, as far as I'm concerned, is you have an umbilical cable to connect your ROV to the surface. Oftentimes, tends to get twisted around or fouled around rocks. You're risking a very expensive piece of equipment that uh, you may not be able to get come up again. We have a diver, a standby, getting ready to jump in the water and go down and rest the ROV if that happens. Even if it's not tangled just by the nature of the environment, because the umbilical would be making contact with so much of the rock surface, the further and further you go, the more drag there is and the harder time the ROV has moving, moving forward. 
Oh, yeah. And then when you turn around and you're going to come back out again, you're going to have this big loop of cable <laughs> behind you. Uh, you have to be very careful with ROVs in certain circumstances. They can be used. I was on a project a few months ago where we were diving in a very large and very deep cave, over 600 feet deep. And it was large enough that we could send the ROV down to the bottom. Even then, the cable did get fouled, and we weren't able to totally fulfill the project. There's considerable difficulties in using ROVs. I'd rather have a human ROV. I'm the ROV. Send me down. So there's huge scope for technological advancement. Oh, for sure. One advancement that people are, are looking into is AUVs, so autonomous underwater vehicles. This gets rid of the cable, and as the AUV goes in, it basically maps the cave. And then when it turns around, it follows the map of the cave it made on the way in to get out. Digital breadcrumbs. Yeah. Is there anything you'd like to add as a final thought? Well, I'd just like to emphasize these caves are so fragile, so vital. They contain a whole new study of life that we have no idea that was there, not just new species, but so many new higher groups of organisms. It's critical to protect and preserve these habitats. Even what we find now, I'm sure that scientists in a decade or several decades are going to be able to do much more. Thanks so much for your time, Tom. I, I really enjoyed that. Good, good. It's always cool to learn things that are new, right? That, that might be our next t-shirt. It's cool to learn things that are new. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really fascinating that both environments have reached points of discovery based on how far humans have either been able to physically go or technologically create. The parallels between the two is crazy. And the fact that he said there are probably deep, deep sea caves. We should coin a new term for that. And that's just like <laughs> so exciting, like mind boggling that there's this whole place that is so far from our reach, but probably exists. It's very, very cool. And that all it takes is a new bit of technology. Mm -hmm. or, or to be honest, in Tom's case, it was wanting to go and have a look. The, the cave diving technology and techniques existed. He sought the knowledge, he sought the training, and then it allowed him to do something. New orders, <laughs> discovering new orders. Like that's that's not something we do like in modern science. Like that's something we did when we, we first started cataloging animals. And you're right, like each time there's a new piece of technology or a new technique, we unlock a little bit more of these cryptic hidden habitats, but there's so much there to go. Oh, deep sea caves. I know that the experts of cave biology are saying that it doesn't exist. There has to be some caves with bioluminescence. There has to be, have been some point in time where it was advantageous to come in and be able to communicate with other members of your species in a place where no one else can have that communication. Surely, surely. <laughs> I just, uh, I don't know. I, I, I give it time. Watch this space. I feel like it's a, it's a great case of evolution not having a plan. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it takes these long, convoluted and wasteful paths, basically. And I, I feel like between the cave systems and the deep sea systems, it's just a fork in the road. And as Martin was saying, like once the things living in the caves have lost their vision, there's no need, there's no advantage to developing bioluminescence. There's no one there to see it. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of symbiosis within the deep sea when it comes to producing light a lot of the bioluminescent organisms do it with symbiotic bacteria mm -hmm. so maybe in that first opportunity that little bit of symbiosis allowed larger more complex animals to produce light that hadn't been before and things hadn't completely lost their vision because things were colonizing from shallower waters and that sort of cemented bioluminescence as a thing in the deep sea mm -hmm. basically mm -hmm. The perfect sweet spot at the right right place, yeah. right time. It's just led to so much. It's almost like the same experiment has been run again with slightly different parameters. Mm -hmm. It really informs the deep sea. I'm glad we branched out. I'm glad we were a little bit cheeky. Absolutely. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> and we told Tom to keep in touch. So if we hear from him, any updates, we'll, we'll share them with you, even though it's off topic. Absolutely. Hello again. This is Don Walsh. 
oceanographer, and explorer. And today's sea story is called Cave Dwellers Under the Sea. But first, a caveat. I am not a marine biologist. I am an oceanographer, but I'm not in the field of biology. So this will be what I would term conversational oceanography, more anecdotal than scientific. This program is really about octopus or octopi and the divers who visit them and are entertained by them. Now, let's consider some of their special characteristics. They are smart, shy, and very curious. But they're hard to see as they can change colors almost instantly. And they can also modify the surface texture of their skin to imitate some of the substrate that they may be located on. They are also great escape artists. In the aquariums, some strange things happened. For example, in Seattle, in the morning, when the people would go back into the aquarium, the back room where they keep the animals in tanks, they'd find water on the floor and they'd find fish missing from the other tanks. They figured out that the octopus were climbing out of their tanks and migrating across the floor and climbing into the other tanks and, and having a very nice dinner. Well, in the ocean, they're, they're not fast swimmers, but they are persistent. They like to hide in holes in the seafloor. It goes to the theme of this month's program about caves and cave diving, where they're protected and they can hang on with their tentacles if somebody tries to remove them. Remove them, they did. There was a sporting event in the late 40s to the mid 60s called octopus wrestling. It's now banned in most places, but it was hard on the animals, though few were killed. You'd pry them out of their holes and bring them up. They would be weighed and the winner would, the person who brought up the biggest, the heaviest octopus, then you put them back in the ocean. But I don't know how the stress on the animal treated them after that. But they also got some revenge because while investigating octopi at home, In their little caves, scuba divers have lost gear, such as cameras, face masks, and the tire irons that divers use to pry uh, abalone off the rocks. If you got down there and were looking in the hole and out comes a tentacle and you say, wow, I'm making a communication with this wild animal, pretty soon that tentacle's wrapped around your camera, your face mask, or your tire iron. And once they've determined that something they would like to have or investigate more than other tentacles come out, they usually win because they can hang on longer than you can. And you're either going to run out of air in your tank or if you're free diving, snorkeling, if you will, then you've got to get up pretty quick. So we don't want to kill or injure them. The best thing to do is to let them have your gear and then come back later and retrieve it. Octopi are really harmless if you don't stress them. If threatened, they can be dangerous. A good motto, as with most zoos, is look but don't touch. They are endlessly entertaining, and it's one of the best shows in the ocean. But if you're not a diver yet, try it. There are plenty of places where you can get trained and certified, and they're mostly in nice, tropical, relaxing places. So you can have a nice vacation and learn something. And that's all for now. Thanks for listening. I heard back from Kate, our dog groomer listener, who we... Did we bully? Who we, who we, who we attempted to, to set the dogs off on the last episode. And she got back in touch. Uh, she said she'd just listened to episode 26. And thanks for saying hi. Uh, good, so we didn't offend her. And for my and the professor's information, she does listen to the podcast while grooming. She usually does it with her headphones on to drown out all the barking and the sound of the tools. But she actually listened to episode 26 over a speaker. And the other groomer working alongside her asked for the link. We now have two listeners within that dog grooming parlor. Thanks, Kate. And hello, Kate's friend. (laughs) Amazing. The plan to expand is going well, Tom. Infiltrate the dog groomers and then from there we're on. We know they're the tastemakers. We know they're the ones that control what's popular. The gatekeepers to Uh, the whole podcasting community. So that's it. We've officially got one extra listener. That takes us up to seven, not including (laughs) our parents. Yeah, we're doing well. We're doing really, really well. (laughs) Oh, the graph. The graph is jumping now. (laughs) When we started the show, we decided to stick to the science because we thought that was the interesting part. That was that was certainly the part that interested us. And we wanted to frame that through the sort of lens of very human scientists and to let their personalities shine through. But it was still very science focused. And we've heard from some listeners that they're actually fascinated by the scientists as as people themselves. What's their average day like? How did they get into this line of work? What are their greatest achievements and defeats? Tips for somebody who wanted to maybe get into the field? We've touched upon that in a lot of episodes about how much luck and just being in the right place at the right time and also bringing something new to the community. It's not just about being a deep sea scientist because everyone 
who you're working with as a deep sea scientist, but it's being the computer vision expert, it's being the geneticist, it's being, you know, even artists and communicators. It's about what else you bring to that sort of talent pool. So we wanted to talk a little bit about that. So we thought about adding another little regular special to our main feed. And we decided to call it the Deco Stop. After you've done a deep dive uh, in scuba, you usually have to break up your ascent so that you don't get the bends. And that can be a little bit time consuming, but it's also sort of cozy and nice. You know, we often play uh, noughts and crosses or tic-tac-toe on the dive slate. You know, you just sort of pass the time. Alan finds the, a sort of similar feeling after he does his sub dives. It can be four hours before he reaches the surface. And the adrenaline and the excitement of all of the science and the discovery has passed. And they'll quite often listen to some music and have a conversation on the way back up and sort of decompress, basically, after the adventure. So we wanted to do this every now and then as a sort of more human focused element to these stories and let these sort of characters shine, both as individual scientists. And I think we can maybe branch out a little bit into where science interacts with other human issues. I've been really cautious to not go political just because sometimes I, I don't feel qualified to talk about that stuff. But we have people we certainly can talk to who are qualified. And so maybe we can explore more of the human science interaction, if that's what you find interesting. So look out for the Deco Stop appearing in the feed for a more human centric look at deep sea science and technology. Alan usually refuses to join in on the puns, but we can do the sign off. You're rubbing your hands together. <laughs> oh, pun, pun, pun. <laughs> so that concludes this episode of the Deep Sea Podcast. We'll deep see you next time. And we abyss you already. The Deep Sea Podcast is supported by a company, Armatus Oceanic. If you would like to explore the deep sea yourself, we can help with cruise planning, logistics and technology to allow you to do that. Or if you'd like to bring the deep sea to your audience, we can help with storytelling, podcasting, fact checking and science communication. We want to make the deep sea accessible to everyone. He's going to be come back and he's going to be like, what have you guys done? <laughs> Two years of work. I'm done in one episode. <laughs> Why is there all this incense burning? Why are you sat on the floor? Have you eaten nothing but ice cream since I left? <laughs>